find ourselves at the very beginning of our journey through Lent, our journey to the cross. Really, the journey for some of us began on Ash Wednesday as we paused to take a sober look at where we have all come from and come to grips with where we shall return and the brevity of the journey in between. The scriptures say that our sojourn in life is brief, as brief as the mist of the morning that appears and then burns away. It's swifter than a runner who runs his fastest race and as momentary as a shadow, here one minute and gone the next. Our eyes close only for a moment and the moment is gone. All our dreams pass before our eyes of curiosity. They're all just dust in the wind. That was Wednesday. Today we're gonna give our attention to the account of the transfiguration of Jesus and Another journey. Listen to the words of Mark chapter 9 as I read from the New Living Translation. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared, and they began talking with Jesus. Peter explained, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he really didn't know what to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and the voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and then only Jesus was with them. As they went back down the mountain, they, he told them not to tell anybody what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's passage begins with six words, or with these words, six days later. If we don't go back to Mark 8, we have no idea what Jesus talking about. That's where it says, then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer terrible things. He must be rejected by the church leaders and that he would suffer and die and three days later he would rise again. Six days earlier, Jesus spelled out to these men, all of them, in no uncertain terms exactly what was going to happen to him when they got to Jerusalem. But Jesus' disciples were having a really hard time with that. Remember, that's when Jesus got right up in, or Peter got right up in Jesus' face and scolded him for even thinking the thought, for talking like that. And Jesus, Jesus scolded him right back with the words, Get behind me, Satan. In that moment, Jesus knew that Peter and all of the other disciples still had some learning to do. They weren't ready for this next journey. And his time was growing short. He was going to have to prepare them and for this next journey that would end at the cross. So, <clears throat> after that, we see Jesus climbing up Mount Horeb, or it might be Mount Moriah. The, the jury's out on that. In any event, Jesus, Peter, James, and John were climbing higher and higher and higher up the mountain. And once they got where they needed to be, Jesus revealed his glory like they had never seen it before. Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus in a way no one had ever seen him. Oh, there had been some inklings of his glory along the way, like the time he turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana. And when the women, woman with the issue of blood was healed, 
just by touching the hem of his garment, or when he fed thousands with just a few loaves and some fish, this moment with his inner circle was even more revealing, a more glorious moment than when he said the words, Lazarus, come forth. <coughs> In this glory-filled moment, when they were all alone, separated from all the chatter and noise of the world around them, high on a mountain, Jesus showed them exactly who it was who was about to suffer and be rejected and die. And his whole countenance changed. His face, his clothes, his everything, as his light became brighter than anything they'd ever seen before, brighter than LED headlights on high beam coming at you at the dead of night. They couldn't even look at her. In that moment, God exalted Jesus. He lifted him high and above everything and everybody. What started out as four men on a mountaintop became six, for Moses and Elijah appeared out of nowhere and were standing there talking with Jesus. And that's when the biggest moment of all occurred, as a cloud came and wrapped itself around all of them, and from the cloud they heard a voice saying, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. In that moment, God exalted Jesus even higher than Moses and Elijah. This Jesus was not a mere man. This was God's son and the Messiah, the long-awaited one. What had Jesus said to the disciples earlier in the scripture? We read it. He said, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. That happened right then. That prediction, that promise was coming true for them right then and there. Jesus, the God-man, was standing before them with Moses, the lawgiver, and with the prophet Elijah. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. The law couldn't save mankind, but Jesus could. This Jesus would do what the law could never do. He would save us all from our sins. And Jesus wasn't just one of the prophets. He wasn't the reincarnation of Elijah. He was the very one the prophets spoke about. He was the Son of God. Now to be truthful, the disciples didn't fully understand what was going on. One author said it was like they were gobsmacked in the moment. That's why Peter said, uh, let's build for you a memorial, a tribute. It was just nervous chatter more than anything. In the moment, his response was to do something and say something, anything. And that's what we do as human beings when we're confronted with a mountaintop experience in our lives. Something that is bigger than anything we've ever experienced before. We want to remember it for all times. Take a picture, take a video, put it on YouTube or put it on TikTok. But this moment in time was more than a moment to be captured by some act or representation and then too soon forgotten because Peter wanted to build a monument. He needed to be in the moment. Have you ever had somebody tell you, Laura has told me this a number of times, when you're on a family thing and you're trying to get that best picture and it's not working, she's looked at me and said, Mom, be in the moment. Put the camera down. Peter needed to be in the moment. Because the truth of the matter is, when I take that picture and it's on my phone, it becomes one of 4,982 other pictures that I never see again unless I'm rooting for something specific. This was not to be a moment like all the other moments. This was to be a moment that touched Peter and James and John in a new and different way. It needed to be a moment where he gave his fullest attention to it if he was ever going to reap the rewards coming from it. Before he could gather one stick, before he could find one palm branch, it was over. As quickly as it had happened, 
it was done. Moses and Elijah and the cloud, they all disappeared and they were gone. And then we're told that Peter, James, and John walked down the mountain with a completely normal looking Jesus. They didn't really know it then, but as they made their descent down the mountain, they were beginning their Lenten journey from the north on the mountain where they were to the south, to Jerusalem, to that place, that city. It would be Jesus' last trip to, to Jerusalem and theirs too, at least with him. But after this experience, they would be more able to take that journey on, for it would be perilous. Everything that they had experienced on the mountain was an effort to help them deal with the dark times ahead. The ridicule, the hatred, the beatings, the actual crucifixion. They had to understand and trust what they had heard coming from the cloud. What had they heard? This is my son. You should listen to him. You can listen to him because he is my son. When Moses and Elijah, those Old Testament prophets, stood with Jesus, the fulfillment of all their preaching, it showed Peter and James and John that the plan for Messiah had come, the plan that they had always known about and heard about was at work, and they could listen to him. When Jesus' face and his clothes shone brighter than the sun, it was proof that he wasn't just an ordinary guy. This was God. And they needed to listen to him. It wouldn't be long, though, before they would see Jesus in a whole new way. And as they saw that vision, because of this moment on the Mount of Transfiguration, they would be better prepared better, but not totally. What they had just experienced then was a preview of coming attractions. <clears throat> a window into the future where on another mountain, well, maybe more like a hill, just outside of town, there would be an even more glorious unveiling. Do you know what that was? Christ's crucifixion. Think about it. There is no greater demonstration of the glory of God that he had, that he shared, than when the crucifixion happened. On that hill, it wasn't just about what God was able to do. I mean, this is God. He could part the seas, he could heal the sick, he could raise the dead. Those are all mind-boggling and heart-stopping miracles. We wouldn't expect anything less from the God who created the heavens and the earth, just by the word of his mouth, who ordered the days and the seasons and breathed the breath of life into man. We know that he could override the laws of science and nature and medicine. That's not surprising. He's God. But at Jesus' crucifixion, that's where his true glory is shown. On that hill far away, it wasn't about what Jesus could do. It was all about what God was willing to do. As they watched him hang on that cross with the crown of thorns on his head, blood and spit flowing from his mouth and his wounds with nails in his hands, when they heard him cry out to the Father and there was no answer, they would need the memory and the revelation of today's mountaintop experience, this moment to reassure them. They would be able, as they remembered, to see that this most unglorious moment is actually the most glorious moment of all. In this moment, God willingly set aside all that was his, the glories of heaven, and took on all that was theirs, all that is ours. He willingly suffered and died. And the reason why is you and I to redeem us, to make us his. 
God revealed Jesus' glory on that mountain so that his disciples could continue to see that glory on this hill. So that they could still continue to listen. So that you and I would have hope and a future. I'd like to say they always remembered what they saw, but we know they didn't. They weren't always able to connect the dots between what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration and what was going on. Peter lost it all on the ear of the guard as he tried to save Jesus and then lied to save himself from being associated with what Jesus was doing. But he wasn't alone. After that, after they had all seen the crucifixion, the completion of the plan that Jesus had told them about, that his time with them wasn't just about what he could do, but what he was willing to do, when they should have been encouraged, they hid and locked the door, afraid to come out. When they realized that the greatest miracle of all, Jesus' resurrection, had happened, that as he said, three days later, he rose, they still hid and locked the doors. Imagine if what would have happened had they not seen Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, if they had not seen him changed into the gloriousness of God. Fear would have totally overtaken them. They had heard, and they had seen. But in those moments, it must have seemed like to them that God had turned off his glory. And to tell you the truth, we're no different. Think about what you have seen and experienced in your life or in the lives of those around you when the body that was once healthy doesn't get better. When the mind that was once right and curious is lost in confusion. When the temptation that plagues you day in and day out won't go away. When life isn't at all what you planned for it to be. The times when God seems to have turned off his glory seems to have turned his back. Our doubts in those situations aren't so much about what, is God, what God is able to do. All we have to do is look around and see the works of his hand. Rather, like the disciples, our doubts are all about what he is willing to do. Like Peter, James, and John, and all the others, we let our fear, our anger, our doubts interfere with our ability to listen. God has not turned off his glory. We've turned off our ears. We have become more focused on what God isn't doing than on what he is willing to do. When Jesus says in his word, I forgive you. When he says in his word, I love you. I will never leave you. I will use even this most difficult moment in your life to bless you. That's God talking. We need to listen, because this is the same God who created the universe, the same God who healed the sick and raised the dead, the same God who set his glory aside and took on all the burdens of mankind, the same God who climbed Mount Calvary with a cross on his back, the same God who was rejected by the people and was punished and died for our sins. And he did all of this to heal us, to redeem us, to pay for our sins, and in the process, to make you and I the most treasured possession that he has. Always remember, then, what God is able to do. But listen to him and understand what he is willing to do. <coughs> He's willing to do far more than we can ever imagine or believe. This is the God who doesn't just control the world and all that is in it, even you and I. This is the God who loves it. No matter how many times we fail, he doesn't stop repeating himself. His message is still the same, strong message of love. He never gives up. 
He's never stopped bringing us back to hear it again and again. And that is when he suffered and died for our sins. He reminds us of that. And he knew exactly what he was doing. And it is, in his, and it is his greatest accomplishment. Because that is what got him, you and me. When he says, I love you, I forgive you, I will never leave you, he means what he says, and he says what he means. And he does what he says he's going to do. And we can take that to the bank. His greatest glory is what he has done and what he is doing and what he will continue to do for you and I. Let's listen to him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, the Mount of Transfiguration. We can't imagine what it was like to be up there, to experience Jesus in all of his glory. But we do have to but look around us and experience his glory everywhere we look, in all that we see. We're thankful that he gave the disciples that moment as a preparation for the journey to encourage so that they would trust him in the face of everything that would happen. Things so unbelievable. Things so dark. And you do that for us. Thank you, Father, for being our encouragement, for always reminding us that you love us and that you are with us and you will never leave us. In all of our dark times and in all of our joys, we give you the praise and glory. Amen. Please stand with me now and let's say what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead.